Thank you, thank you very much uh, to you all for, for coming, very nice meeting you. And I am happy to come back to the Hong Kong Book Fair and to share uh, uh, this uh, book, this essay, uh, where we have been working together, Peter Gordon and, and me, and we have made, I think, very, very important discoveries. And the landing of the Portuguese in India uh, in 14, uh, 98 by Vasco de Gama and in Calicut, the southwest Indian coast, was one of the most important events in the history of humanity. So it changed the course of history. For the first time, they met directly east and west. It is remarkable the anecdote that as their men, the Portuguese sailors, uh, went on shore, they met with Arab traders, traders from Tunisia who spoke to them in Spanish. Uh, ¿Qué demonios hacéis aquí? What the hell are you doing here? And the Portuguese sailors answered also in Spanish, Venimos por cristianos y por especias. We come for Christians and for spices. This anecdote tells us many things. The world was getting smaller then. Portuguese coming to India, meeting Arab traders, and they speak Spanish between all of them. And also with this sentence, they explain why they came here. They were, it is true, for an apostolic uh, endeavor, so uh, because of their faith, but also because something very specific, okay. material, the spices, the trading spices. And it is not a coincidence that this Kerala coast is, was the region, uh, the largest producer of pepper in the world. And so they come actually after a myth, the myth of Prester John, and uh, that was thought to, to be in Asia, in Ethiopia or, or India, and for spices. The Portuguese then will conquer by force several spots very, very quickly. Ormuz, so where they have the control to the Persian Gulf, they conquer, of course, Calicut, the place, the first place where they go. Goa in 1510, Diu in the same coast in the region of Gujarat, in India. They conquer in 1511 with Alburquerque, uh, Malacca, that was a key entry port to control the trade in the southeast in Southeast Asia, and they reach the Moluccas or Spice Islands. So the producers of cloth and nutmeg, and uh, so uh, that they have been looking after for centuries. And finally, the Europeans, the Portuguese, they have access to them. So not only they have ac uh, settled some uh, fortresses, a uh, chain of fortresses along the most important entry ports, but also they, uh, they establish their own agents. Uh, or representatives. So it was a seaborne trading empire, no land, uh, no, mainly no territory. They never achieved a monopoly on the trade. So there was, and they never pretend to take over the means of production. That this happens late centuries later with the Dutch and the, Portu and, and, and the English with very serious effects for the region. So in a way, they were almost one more. And after this first stage of violence, so to speak, so taking by force all these key entry ports in all the, uh, the, the, the codes, maybe we, we can show the, the map of the Sebastian Muster of the... So this map uh, by Sebastian Muster is uh, is around 1545, uh, the time of the, of the codex that we are going to talk. 
this album of paintings. And so it explained really all the, the places that the Portuguese would take. You see Goa here and Calicut. Uh, Calicut, the, the first place where they arrived, Ormuz, and the Malacca, and, and all the Moluccas, or spices, Spice Islands. At the time uh, of this codex that we believe was made around 1540, uh, they had reached uh, China in 1513, but uh, they didn't have a stable relation, uh, trading relation with China yet, and they didn't arrive uh, in Japan yet, that it was in the early 1540s. So this is why there is not a vignette or picture of Japan in the codex. And uh, 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 I said at the beginning that uh, they conquered Goa in 1510, and it was in 1530, when they established the capital of their trading empire in Goa, they call the all the region they dominate Estado da India, so the like uh, the administrative uh, uh, state or colonies. Although the word colonies normally is not used by by, by them, and for India, so Goa is going to be the capital of Estado da India. That in reality is all the map that we have Spain from the eastern coast of Africa and uh, the South Indian continent and Southeast Asia. This uh, Goa uh, was a, a small place where maybe uh, everyone knew each other, and this is important for the goddess, and was also a very cosmopolitan place. It was called Goa Dorada, so it means the golden Goa, like a rich place. And is here where we believe a, a Portuguese patron met a, an Indian painter, and they in the commission to produce this album of album of watercolors, where there is uh, depictions of daily everyday life in India, and also description of the peoples of this maritime silk road. So we can use this word as uh, like the trading that it has been for centuries, so uh, before the Portuguese came, and this is why the Portuguese came. And uh, the Codex, uh, or Codice Casanatense, has, was in Goa from the time it was produced, around 1540, to around uh, 16, uh, before 1628. And we believe there is a relation also with the beatification and canonization of St. Francis Xavier that uh, he went to Goa in 1542 and well, he died in San Juan, a very small island south of Macau, very near here, very near Hong Kong. And although his uh, remains were uh, taken, uh, he died in 1552, the 3rd of December. So. We know this because also in, in Spain many people have this name, including my brother. And we know 3 of December died and was taken to Goa uh, the, in, in February of uh, 1553. And uh, it is relevant that the Codex was in Lisbon at the time of the canonization of St. Francis. Uh, this Codex or Codice uh, was acquired but uh, a cardinal, uh, Napolitan cardinal, uh, Girolamo Casanata, with a, we will call a prince of the church, so he was in charge of the department of the doc doctrine of the church, and he was a great collector of books, and uh, he uh, be bequeathed the, the, book, only the book to the library that he set up in the uh, Dominican monastery in Rome, in, Sopra, Maria Sopra Minerva, and now it belongs to the state, to the Italian state, but it's one of the most important libraries in Europe uh, after uh, the Cardinal de Romo Casanata, so it's called the uh, Casanata Library, or, or, or Casanatense, Biblioteca Casanatense. And uh, I give Turn over to me, the word to Peter. Um, I'm going to, probably didn't do these in quite the right order, I'm going to go back right 
back from there to this one. Um, the uh, the Codice Casadatense has got 76 watercolors. They're all loose sheets, not bound. And this is one of the nicest one, I think. One of the, one of the nicest ones you can see a Portuguese grandee uh, out hunting with his falcon. Uh, and he's got an entourage of people behind him, and obviously an Indian servant with a parasol. So this is kind of the, the way they look. But it's usually not Portuguese people. Most of them are uh, ordinary Indian people. And they fall really into two groups of paintings. One of them are professions. See, these are blacksmiths. Okay. Uh, and the second group um, are couples. Like here, these are. This is a, and I guess you, you'd say these are, the, the couples are what today we would call national dress. Uh, and as we'll see, these couples go all the way from East Africa to East Asia, and all the points in between, and it maps very, very closely onto what we now call the Maritime Silk Road. So that's why we say that the paintings are really from the Maritime Silk Road. Uh, this couple is from Malacca, uh, at least. That's what the annotation says. Each of the uh, illustrations is some have written a little note on it as to what it is. But as we'll see, you shouldn't take the annotations too seriously, and maybe not all of the illustrations either, because you can see this uh, woman from Malacca is kitted out in a very nice sari. This is a map of Goa from the time. And this is the church of Nossa Senhora do Rosario. And it isn't quite the oldest building in Goa that still exists, but it's just about the second or third oldest. And it dates from about the time the codex was being drawn up, about this time, 1540-ish. And I put the church up for, for a reason. This is one of the paintings from the codex, and you know, if you went to visit the Red Fort in Delhi, and you went to go buy a painting of people somewhere, it kind of looked like that, right? Uh, and, and as we go through the codex, you'll see many things that kind of look sim similar to, to the sorts of things you might see today. So just about the time when the church of uh, Nossa Senhora do Rosario was open, the vicar general of Goa wrote a letter back to Lisbon, and this is what he said. And Goa custavam os pintores gentios pintar imagens de Nosso Senhor, Nossa Senhora e nos outros santos e vezem-se por as belas portas. Which means roughly, in Goa, native painter, painters hang, hung around the doors of the church uh, selling paintings of, uh, of our Lord and our Lady and the saints to the people who are coming out of the church. Um, that's kind of what goes on today in, the, in, a, in any tourist place in India. Gentios, for people that are interested, is actually our word for Gentile. Uh, but it didn't mean that quite uh, in India. Uh, it meant, here it means non-Christian, non-Jew, non-Muslim. Uh, and the word exists in Indian English in exactly this meaning well into the 19th century. Some version of gentio or gentio. Now, as I say, we might imagine one of these pintores gentios, one of these native painters, sidling up to one of the gentlemen as they came out of the church and asking whether he might like paintings of something other than saint. For example, maybe something like this. Um, this is women bathing, uh, maybe. Um, but I, it's a rather nice painting. You know, you look, look at all the clothes that are so carefully hung on the branches behind them. Um, or maybe painting of a religious ceremony. Uh, in this case, uh, some uh, Indian religious leader uh, official cutting the head off and self-sacrificing himself. So uh, <laughs> these, these, they're, they're certain of the paintings that are rather picot. You have an idea they might have been painted to, uh, for, to titillate Western tastes. Uh, not all the illustrations are backed up by outside evidence. Okay? So, it can be sometimes hard to know if the illustration is portraying something real uh, 
or as a figment of somebody's imagination, such as the Moroccan woman dressed in the sari. But often enough, the paintings reflect things that we already know. And this one is a betrothal, or maybe a marriage, between a Portuguese man and an Indian woman. All done very formally. It's a formal affair. Uh, and you know, based on our impressions of what we think colonialism is all about, this might seem somewhat unusual, that there would be this kind of uh, formal betrothal between the rulers and the ruled. But in fact, uh, it, this was formal policy. Uh, as far back as the founding of Go in 1510, Alfonso de Albuquerque, uh, the Portuguese uh, general took the city, the commander took the city, wrote, aqui se tomaram algumas muras, which you can read up there in Portuguese. Um, basically, it, there we go. That's what he said. Um, Portuguese is right. Aqui se tomaram algumas muras, mulheres alvas, e de bom para ser, e alguns homens limpios, e de bom quiseram casar com elas, e ficar aqui nesta terra, me pidieron fazenda, y os casé con elas en el casamento ordenado de vuestra alteza. Which means roughly, we take good men who wish to remain in the land and marry them to well-favored local women. Uh, the women had to convert, of course, they had to convert to Christianity, and more than a few came with rather large dowries. These resettled soldiers were known as casados, or married men. I'll turn back over to society involved in general south of India, it could be divided into the Hidalgos or lower nobility, the soldiers, adventurers, and the Casados. The Casados, married men, were really the backbone of the Portuguese society. Uh, they also uh, helped in the administration, uh, but they were normally uh, private traders, so they were settlers, but the settlers in India, because we have said from the beginning that it's a Portuguese people, it's a seaborne empire, it's a trading empire, they will be traders. And this is why sometimes, uh, so they will marry locally, normally, uh, because it was forbidden uh, for Portuguese women, women to, to go to, to, to India, uh, say exception, they will marry locally, not necessarily women from, from India, but maybe uh, uh, ladies from the region. And then their interest and in how they uh, uh, fit in the place will be very special, very special role. So they will bridge really the two worlds. And this is important for the goddess. This is important to explain Portuguese India. And <coughs> they were training not only in, in the spices, So as, as Juan mentioned, uh, much of Goa's wealth actually came from their monopoly of the horse trade. Uh, and some of the best horses came from Persia. Uh, and there are lots and lots of horses in the Codex. Uh, coincidentally, or probably not coincidentally, you know, the Portuguese knew their horses. So this particular illustration is a couple uh, from Persia. The man's on a horse. The woman, I think, probably a bit fancifully is on a camel. But they find all kinds of horses in the codex. The other thing that there's a lot in the codex is weapons. Um, the casados were all former soldiers. Uh, and as such, they'd have an interest in weapons. And they know their weapons. And so the weapons are shown in the codex in considerable detail. This is a man from Aceh uh, in the northern part of Sumatra. And um, I'm not sure if, there we go, this works. You can see this here's a kris. 
right? um, unmistakably occurs. And if there's an earlier representation of a Chris in Western style artwork, we don't know what it is. We think this is the first one. Um, and then you have to ask yourself the question, given that there probably weren't Achenese or Indonesians or people from the Spice Islands wandering around the streets of Goa, how did this painter know what a Chris looked like in 1540? Um, this stumped us for a very long time. We couldn't figure this out. But it turns out that the Portuguese were fascinated by this wavy dagger. You know? uh, it's really lethal. You stick it in, and it doesn't come out very easily because the blade is wavy. And the Portuguese thought this was really fascinating. They're described by the chroniclers of the time. Uh, and some of them were given to the king of Portugal. So King Manuel of Portugal had some of these in his collection. So these were actually well known at the time. The next one that I thought was rather nice, this is a uh, man from Basra, which is now in southern Iraq. Um, and he has a rifle or a musket. And here you can see the flintlock. Okay. Um, and the firing mechanism is drawn very clearly. The, the thing I, the conclusion I drew from this is that, again, the guy that commissioned the codex knew his weapons. I don't think the Indian painter did. But the guy that commissioned it knew the weapons, and he wanted them drawn properly. In other illustrations, there are many different kinds of swords. You know, the curved swords of the east, the straight swords from the west, uh, and then the sort of machete-type blades that you find out in the uh, Spice Islands. There are shields, round shields used in India, which we'll see later on. And the elongated shields from places like Sulawesi are also very accurately drawn here. So again, the point is somebody here was paying attention to what at least the weapons looked like. Uh, this picture is labeled as patans. Uh, and again, this took us a bit of a time to figure out what this was too. Patans are people that live in, along the Pakistan-Afghan border, that area in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, this is not them. There had been uh, Afghans uh, in India for hundreds of years before this who had come in with earlier conquerors. And there were Patans at the time. There were a group of them living around what is now called Patna in Bihar. So that's who these people were. So this is much closer to the Bengal side of India, actually, than the Afghan side. Um, the Portuguese were, were uh, the Portuguese were in Bengal. That's how they probably knew about this. Um, but these are very particular bows. See, if you look at your, if, if you if you know bows from uh, from King Arthur days, they didn't have this bend going back. This is called a recurve bow. Uh, they're very common in Mongolia. They're common throughout the steppe. This is a this is a bow from the steppe, a nomadic bow. And you can see that they're shooting backwards. This is a very particular uh, military maneuver called the Parthian shot, where you turn and shoot backwards over the, over the rear of your horse as you're running away. And it was something that the nomads did all the time. So again, this is somebody was paying attention to, uh, to, to, to these sorts of things. So who do we think the patron was? Who was the guy that put all of this together? And you've probably guessed by now that we think he was one of these casados. Right? Uh, they were the most to, to choose from. They, they used to be in India for a very long time, in India for a long time, their whole lives. The Fidalgos, who came from Portugal, didn't stay very long. They would come for a few years and go back home. So they really wouldn't have had time to, to, to amass a collection like this. Um, and the illustrations all show things that a casado would be interested in. He would be interested in the horses. He'd be interested in the weapons. And he'd be interested, because they were all trading people, they would be interested in all the places where the Portuguese had a foothold. And if you go through the codex, each place where there's a label, someone from here, someone from Pegu, someone from Malacca, someone from Java, someone from Abyssinia, these are all places where the Portuguese had interests and maybe, a, maybe they had a, a town, but certainly had trading interests and had been. Okay, so this is why we're pretty sure that the patron itself uh, is a Casado. Now, who might he be? 
Well, there's a story in the uh, codex itself. So remember this one. This is the guy getting married. Okay. Now, we've seen him before. Remember the entourage? That's the same guy. This one and this one. Right? Now, the beard's the same. They're basically both dressed in red. They got the same hat. You could say, you know, that, that, to, to, that to Indians, all white people look alike. Okay? But, you know, they don't all look alike. Because look what he's done. The other two are completely different. See? They don't look like him at all. And you can kind of see he's come up in the world. He has a better sword here. This one's got a fancier grip than this one. And uh, he's got a slightly better jerkin. But sure looks like the same guy to me. Right? Um, so why would somebody appear twice in the codex if it's not the guy that was paying for it? Why would you have some random guy appear twice in your, in your collection of paintings if it's not you? So our guess is that this is the guy who put the picture together. And you can see he's there off getting married to an Indian woman. He's a casado. Okay, he started off probably in the entourage, one of the soldiers uh, for, for that grandee. And then here he's obviously come up in the world a little bit and he's getting married. You know, even if it's not true, it's a nice story. <laughs> I prefer to believe it. Okay, we're not done. So here's, here's, the, here's this grandee again. We don't really, we don't know who he is, uh, but you look at him, it's a fair guess he's a governor of Goa. I'm not sure, but. And one of the reasons that we're pretty sure that he's pretty high up in the hierarchy is that the other half of this, this is a double spread, it folds out. The other half is this uh, Portuguese woman in the palace. There were very, very few Portuguese women in Goa. Some of the few that were there were those few of the governors are able to bring their wives out. So now, she might look a little bit familiar too. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask Juan to explain what this is, but there's this kind of, again, Portuguese woman who's kind of watching over the ceremony. And she's probably what in Portuguese would be called a madrinha. Juan, you want to explain what that is? Uh, madrinha will have a religious role. So it would be uh, like the godmother in the baptism of uh, a priest and a performer. And it makes sense that uh, she has a presence also in the wedding. So the madrinha uh, acts as a godmother in the baptism. Of the of the new convert, but also in the wedding. So is that uh, so? Is really with with a role of protection, and also is going to care for the Christian ed education of of this lady. And uh, well, it makes sense that is also a lady of mm, high society. Uh, maybe we believe that. The, the wife of, uh, of a governor. So um, it could be that all of this is just random chance, but if we assume that it's not, that, the, that, that all of that's there for a reason, we're beginning to get a story of who it was that put this together. There is a rel relatively well-to-do Casados uh, who had married, who had probably been in, in close entourage to one, of, to one of the governors or senior military leaders who then got married to an Indian woman, and then later on in his life began to then collect these paintings about his life, and he put himself in his collection of paintings. I'm now going to run through uh, the different kinds of people that appear in the Codex, because this, these paintings are almost all about people. There are one or two that aren't, but of the 76, something like 73 are about people. Uh, and before I do that, though, I, I want to point out that these are basically ordinary people. These are 
farmers and washerwomen and blacksmiths and ordinary couples and the old hands and they're just ordinary people. And this is quite unlike um, the sorts of paintings that you find in India at the time mostly. You know, the other paintings tend to be kings and queens and mythological figures. There really aren't that many thick paintings of like ordinary people uh, doing what they do in every day. So here are women uh, fetching water. Um, I don't think there's anything profound about any of these paintings, but I just think they're, they're really rather charming paintings. Um, and you can see there's, there's quite a lot of detail here. None of them have any shoes on. They're all barefoot. Okay? But they all got stacks of bangles. You see all the bangles? Okay. And they got earrings. So they're quite, they're quite dressed up going to fetch the water. And this is one of the things that's so marvelous about this painter is that uh, he's obviously paying attention to this kind of detail. Uh, you will find people with different kinds of clothes and different designs and different, uh, different kinds of turbans and different this, that, and the other thing, different weapons as we've seen. He's got, a, he's got an eye for detail. These are not quite stock pictures he's pulled out of, out of, out of somewhere. The next one is a... Uh, part of a marriage ceremony, uh, a Hindu marriage ceremony. We actually uh, sent this off to, uh, to someone in Goa to have a look through, and he pointed out that the man is wearing a uh, outfit with, button, with buttons on the front, uh, which is actually an, a Muslim garment, uh, because the, the area just outside of Goa were the Muslim sultanates of the Deccan, uh, and so there was quite a lot of Muslim influence there. And so again, you can see that the painter has taken one of the details from the time that we can now verify and put them in the paintings. Uh, these are washermen and washerwomen. Uh, you may remember him from the, from the first slide. He'll come back, so remember him. Um, but again, you see, so these are, these are just ordinary people washing clothes, carrying them back, and here they're delivering. This is a money changer sitting in the central bazaar. Uh, there you can see a stack of coins. Uh, you can see people who are coming down to do, do business with him. Um, he sure looks like a Portuguese guy running down the hill. So uh, they would, it seems the Portuguese would make use of uh, the local money changer as well. You can't, maybe you can just about see it here. This is the label and the word for this in Portuguese was sharafo. Does that sound like something? Shroff, exactly. That's where our word shroff comes from. So if this were in Hong Kong today, you'd be sitting in a parking garage or something like that. But that's where the word comes from. It's originally a Persian word, came into India, and from Indi India it came here. This is um, one of the uh, only real picture of a potentate, except for possibly the Portuguese governor uh, that's in the codex. He's the only big shot. Uh, and he surely is a big shot. He's obviously some sort of an Indian potentate, and he's sitting on an elephant, and this is his wife. She's obviously hunting. He's hunt but they must be hunting because she's got a hawk. This one, um, it's a nice painting, but it's important for a reason because it tells us something important about the dating. The annotation, which is up in here on this side, says that this is the king who laid siege to the fortress of Diu, which is near Goa. Um, that is one of the kings of the Deccan. The Portuguese were already in the fortress, and the, and the local sultan emir went and, and put it under siege. Uh, and we know when that was. That was in 1538. Okay, so we know that whoever at least was writing this had to have been writing it 1538 or afterwards. He couldn't, he couldn't have been doesn't quite tell us when the paintings were done, but at least means that the annotations could not have been done before 1538. Um, another thing about it is that one of the things Juan and I learned is that these annotations, some was labeled them, are really unreliable. Some of them just have got mistakes in them. Places are wrong. Uh, but this one um, is when we're trying to figure out what's going on, the if the annotation is correct. We know who this guy was. He was King Mahmud the, the, the Third. 
uh, and he would have been about 11 years old at the time. Now, there are not many 11-year-olds that can sport mustaches like that. So our feeling is it's probably not him. Uh, it's probably uh, some, other, some, some other potentate, of which there were several, it could be. Um, if we have time, I mean, there's, a, there's a marvelous story about one who it might be. <coughs> but again, um, uh, so we know that these annotations were not done by the patron. And we know this for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons we know is because the annotations are done in two different sets of handwriting. So at least the patron didn't do all of them. Someone else did them. And, and then secondly, there are some of them that are just wrong. So our feeling is that this is somebody who took the paintings afterwards, maybe after the patron had left the scene, and was trying to work out what they were and wrote, wrote, wrote on them afterwards. Um, this one is another fun painting. Uh, here's a painting of the Portuguese having dinner in a, in a pool. And the annotation says it was in Hormuz, which is in Iran, Persia, where the people eat in the water because it's so hot. <clears throat> now, there actually are reports of Hormuz being very, very hot, uh, and Portuguese lying about in, you know, in pools of water or in buckets to try to keep cool. There's no actual report of them eating in there. So it looks like it's a somewhat garbled, uh, that, that, that the, <clears throat> the artist drew this from some sort of a garbled report. But still, you know, it had to have been drawn from life. Look how detailed the sleeves are. And over here, you can see the, sle the, the women's sleeves have got these cuts in them, you know, which if you look at paintings of the period, you'll see exactly that kind of dress. So the painter must have been watching these things and, 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 and painting them from life. Uh, the other reason we know this can't really be Hormuz is because this is a typical Indian tank. If you go to an Indian temple, you'll see exactly this kind of pool done, in, done like this. And this is not Persian. This is, this is Indian. This one, I just, no particular reason to put it in, but it's just kind of fun. This is a naval battle of some kind. Uh, two Indian ships um, going at it quite hard. There's some guns and there's some arrows. Um, the, uh, the ship is interesting. It's, it's, as you see, it's got both sails and oars, which was very typical for sort of light military vehicles, uh, military ships of the time. Now I'm going to come back to this one. Uh, remember our Catans? Uh, this was also a double spread. This one's rare because it's two guys, right? Uh, they're not a couple. The rest of the couple is on the other half of the spread. Okay, uh, those are their wives. Now, <clears throat> this is an. This is we were trying to work out where did these, how did the painter draw these things that he had never seen. And this particular pair gave us a very good clue. The annotation says that the Patans are very fierce, as are their wives who go fight with them. Um, but as you can see, they're not fighting. They're hunting. So there were reports of what the Portuguese called Amazonas, Amazons, women warriors, uh, that would fight in regiments um, in that region. But there was a better, uh, but one of the Portuguese chroniclers, which Juan will talk about in just a minute, called Tomás Pires, said that the women used to fight but no longer do. Now they hunt instead. So what we have is clearly the illustrator taking information from one, one piece of information but the guy writing the annotations was taking it was taking the information from somewhere else and got it wrong. Well, you want to talk a little. You want to come back to this question of uh, chroniclers. Yes. We'll keep on going. Uh, when we get to China. Yes. Or when we get to China. This one's kind of fun. These are what are known as Saint Thomas Christians. Um, one of the apostles, Saint Thomas, went to India. They say, uh, died there. But certainly there were Christians there from a very, very early date. I think there certainly there are records of them from the second or third century in India. Um, so again, so these are, this, is, this is the 
the cross here, the I and RI on the top of the cross. So these are this picture of Christians. Um, and the paintings themselves go all the way from, from Ethiopia. This is labeled as Abyssinia. So this is in East Africa. Again, this East African woman has a very nice sari. So you can probably guess the picture had been there. <laughs> um, and they go all the way to China. Yes, this is one of the most uh, intriguing and interesting pictures in the codex. It represents the Chinese, or at least this is what the caption says. Uh, Peter has reminded us that uh, sometimes they really don't match the captions and the picture. Uh, an explanation that uh, who wrote the, the caption and, and the painter didn't coordinate. And this is also an example when you study uh, old chronicles or old pictures that sometimes they are really unreliable. And the reasons why they are done th this way could be really many, also because maybe the instructions pass uh, between too many, too many people. But it may also tell us something about the time when this uh, codex was drawn. Relations with uh, China, so uh, Macau was only granted 1557, so much later than the codex. And here in the in the in, in, in the codex, so they they mention in the caption something that we find in a very important chronicle of the time that is Summa Oriental by uh, Thomas Pires. Thomas Pires was an apothecary, so like a pharmacist and a specialist in the spices. So it was uh, many people a specialist in this because. Uh, trading in spices was the most, the most important or high value trade. And uh, Tomet Pires had been uh, wrote the Summa Oriental in 1515, very early. And most likely he met the Chinese there in Malacca. And so he has been uh, only in Malacca and Goa when the King of Portugal, King John, sent him as, as an ambassador to China. It was an ill-fated uh, embassy because, uh, well, uh, they didn't let them go and uh, they executed some of the members. And Tomé, uh, Tomé Pires uh, died in, in China. We don't know, so we lose uh, his whereabouts. But uh, his Summa Oriental survived. There is also some misfortune for what the Portuguese wrote. They wrote many very dense, long chronicles of the time, but uh, almost nothing uh, was published during their lifetimes. Even the account of Tomé Pires, written in 1515, Summa Oriental, was only discovered by a very important Portuguese historian, uh, Armando Cortesal, just last century, in 1944, in published in Portuguese and in English. And the, in the description of the Chinese, of Tomé Pires, they say, the Chinese are white, as white as we are. They wear well-made French shoes with a square toes. A square toes? <laughs> so it matches the codex, the chronicle of Tomé Pires, one of the most important books, so to speak, in the history of the encounter between Asia and the West. They wear pleated skirts uh, with waistbands and little loose coats. So it matches. Normally, so uh, nowadays we expect that we don't uh, have information of what is written in a book until the book is published. But in those times, particularly when there are small societies, and the, the people who know how to read are really very few, it happens that they know what are they writing about. Even they have an echo, if you study all these publishing projects of the past. So there is all, a lot of controversies and, and polemics if, just with the draft. So this information circulated. And, and it is 
also for me very interesting uh, as I have been studying uh, relations between China and, and the Spanish world that the mention of the, the Chinese women look like the, the, the Spanish women and they say that they are beautiful are the Spanish women it happens many times in all the Spanish chronicles and it happens several times in Portuguese chronicles as we have seen yeah. okay so the uh, last thing we have to talk about is who the painter was um, it turns out we know quite a lot about it. Um, the same letter from 1545 from the Vicar General talks about the painters outside the church, and that's what he wrote in Portuguese. Here we go. Uh, and what this means in roughly is that among these painters, there's a boss who's a painter of great ability. Uh, the others do what he tells them to do. And this sounds today what, like what we would call a workshop. A bunch of painters all together, one guy's in charge, and they take commissions and they do work on contract. Now, when Juan and I first looked at the codex, you know, we, we looked and said, boy, these paintings look familiar. Right? We've seen something like this before, and we really, we could never find a smoking, a smoking gun. You know, but then we stumbled upon this painting. Now, this is from a small book by a guy called Balthasar Sprenger, who was an Austrian trader who went to India on the 1505 voyage that the Portuguese uh, sent to India. And he came back in 1507. And in 1590, he published this little small book about it, not very big, 28 pages or something like that. And it was illustrated with uh, these woodcuts by a guy called Wolf Trout. Um, well, this is from the Codex. It just seems incontrovertible that the painter had seen this book, right? Now, it doesn't sound too surprising if there's going to be one book, one Western book, one secular book that isn't the Bible uh, or a book of prayer that'll be in Goa, it'll be the book about somebody who went to India before. Uh, so it's perhaps not surprising that this book was in Goa, but it's quite clear that this Indian painter had seen it. Now, there are a um, series of these couples that we see in the codex. You may have seen things like this elsewhere, you know, in maps of the time. There are always people in the native dress around the outside. And people in Europe had begun to do this sorts of thing. This is one from called In Arabia. Uh, from, it is a woodcut from the early part of the 16th century by an artist called Hans Burgmeier, um, who also did some things from India. And this is from the Codex. This isn't quite a slam dunk like the other one was, but you can see it's the couple. The hands are the same. She's got a veil on. So this idea of this couple's in native dress seems to have been taken from maybe a woodcut or two must have found its way to India as well. Now that doesn't tell us a lot about who the painter was. Okay. And we were having because the, the, the paintings in the codex weren't matching up with paintings from the region around there. It was really hard to work out who he was. And then we came across this. And you might look at the way the body position and the way they do the fill and some of the lines to do the outlines of the, of the drapery. And this is the marriage dance from the codex. So the previous one, uh, is from a manuscript, of, a Jain manuscript, Jain being one of the, one of the sects in India, a very large sect. And um, so we think on the basis of this that the artist was probably at least trained in the Jain tradition. We have another reason to think so. Um, this is a detail from what is known as a Jain invitation scroll. And what this would be is that there would be a town and they would try to invite religious leaders to come spend time in their town, if you like, give it face. And they would do this by sending this very, very long scroll where they would paint what was going on in the town. You know, the main street and the, and the shops and who was going on in the shops. And so this is, you know, uh, different people weighing things and there's a goldsmith and uh, there's a goldsmith from the code. So it seems to me 
the evidence seems pretty good that this is, um, this is the tradition that the artist came from. But there's, there's one that I think is really a slam dunk. Remember this painting? Okay. Now, you can look at this. This is a special kind of palaquin. It's, it's known as a swinging palaquin. Uh, you see the two sort of smaller uh, attendants down below. And this is from a Jain temple in Tamil Nadu in southern India. We think it's an early 16th century. Um, uh, it's been heavily restored, so we're not, we're not entirely sure. But it sure looks like, uh, this isn't to say that the painter has seen this, because this kind of image is seen in, in more, than one, more than one temple in India. But what he's done, I think, is really rather clever. He's taken this Indian composition, and he's repurposed it to show a non-Indian scene. So he's, he's quite an innovative painter. So for all of these reasons, we have a pretty good idea of who the painter was. He was probably trained in this particular artistic tradition, um, perhaps not to the full extent because he, he scarpered and started to work for, for Portuguese people. Uh, he had someone who had access to Western artwork. He's someone with a very good eye. Uh, he's someone who could draw from description, right? Uh, and he was an artistic innovator because he took these Indian compositionals, compositions and used them for another purpose. So we have a postscript. And the one misspelling is there, so we're just going to go over this very quickly. Um, what happened next? Uh, in the early 17th century, uh, the manuscript was residing at the Colegio de Sao Paulo, the school founded by Francis Xavier. Uh, but there's no record of it there. We know it left there, but there's no record of it when it was there. So there are hints, though, that it didn't disappear between 1540 and 1620. And one of the hints is found in uh, this book, the Itinerario, which was published by uh, this Dutchman, uh, whose name I can't pronounce, Jan Hugen van Linkshoten, in 1596. He was the guy that did the drawing of Goa that you saw right at the beginning. He had been living in Go in 1580 as the secretary to the archbishop. And this is one of the drawings uh, in the itinerario. It's a picture of a Portuguese woman in a palaquin in Goa, and that maybe looks familiar too. There she is. So it seems to me incontrovertible that this guy, who was secretary to the archbishop in Goa, had seen this manuscript. So wherever it was, it was not hidden away in a drawer somewhere. But it was certainly deemed important enough that somebody in the archbishop office would go see it. Now, Juan, I'm going to turn over to you. You want to finish up with, Juan, with Van Lieshoffen and tell people who he was? Yes. Um, uh, Lieshoffen's uh, book, Itinerario, which means voyage, uh, is one of the most important books uh, in the history of the encounter between uh, Asia and the West. And having been at, at the service of, of the uh, Bishop of, of Goa, then shifted uh, sides. And he was of Dutch origin, and as the Dutch uh, was becoming an independent republic, uh, he disclosed all the information he had a very important information, first-hand information, to the Dutch. Uh, it took a long time to publish what uh, his, his draft, his, his book, and, but all, obviously he was very good at, at, at drawing as well. He was a highly educated person. Uh, we have seen uh, this, this is a copper plate etching print, but obviously uh, a direct copy of the codex. There are at least four of these prints that they are uh, unmistakably copies of the goddess. So he has access to the goddess. We have said that Koa was a small place. People knew each other, and particularly in in, in clerical circles, uh, this this would be uh, I mean easy to get access. It also gives an idea that the goddess was considered something very important for the people who has a relation with that, with it. And uh, yes, I think, uh, well, one of the most important uh, information that he goes is one of the most beautiful 
maps of, uh, of Southeast Asia that it was reproduced uh, many times. There is a, a last uh, connection that I think uh, to make also with the company, company painters. So we have mentioned already the relation of uh, St. Francis Xavier so in, in Goa, but this better we finish with this. Okay, so you remember yeah. this painting? This one dates from uh, 1540. It dates from 1780. Um, this is what is known as company art. Uh, this is one of the earliest examples of company art. These were done, you know, um, it's, like, it's like some of the China trade paintings that were done out here in, in, in Guangzhou and Canton. They were done for, you know, for the foreigners who lived there. Um, now, clearly this is not a copy because th there, were, there were hundreds, if not thousands. This one is from, I think, um, uh, from, from southern India, right on the other side of India. So a thousand, a thousand kilometers away and 250 years later. But boy, you know, there, there must be some artistic tradition and there's just nothing in between. There's just nothing, there have to be, but there are just no paintings in between these two. Um, and again, if you look at more modern things, you can actually seem to draw a line from the codex up to company art and then frankly the sorts of things that you would buy in the airport when you're leaving Delhi to come home. Mr. Peter Gordon and Mr. Juan Jose Morales for sharing such inspiring content. We will now move on to the Q&A session. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask our speakers now. Please, one. When you begin your talk, uh, there's mention Yes. Uh, watercolors are on papers. Yes. And can they be preserved until this day, considering 500, 600 years, years ago? Well, apparently, yes. <laughs> I think so. I mean, they, they have been. Um, they, they still exist, and they're in pretty good condition. Yeah, no, I think, I, I, you know, I think it's probably pretty heavy watercolor. Some of it's probably closer to what you call gouache, mm -hmm. you know, um, but it's not oil or, or anything like that. It's watercolor. How come to the extent that this is a Portuguese colony? Uh, all the paintings are Indian style paintings. Right. But, um, and the annotation is in Portuguese. Right. So it seems like the annotation is added to the painting afterwards. Um, I think the story is a bit more complicated than that. You, you can see that, that there's a difference between yeah. the Western style paintings like, like Bobby style painting. The painting, the painter is clearly Indian. There's just no question that he's Indian. Indian. 
uh, but it's all. But it, it also seems clear that they, that the the guy who commissioned the paintings, the reason he did them, was because some Portuguese guy paid him to do it. Mm. Because Indians were not painting these scenes, and there's just too much in there that is of interest to the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. All the weapons, uh, all the different costumes, all of these things, the horses. Uh, it just seems clear that there was a Portuguese patron and an Indian painter. Mm -hmm. And then you're right, someone else came along later and added the notation mm -hmm. to it. The Western style painting is very different because when you have in Arabia that painting, that's a Western painting, Western style painting, and also the comparison between the, uh, the two persons. Mm -hmm. One's holding a bag, the, the ladies, the, the, other, the other one on the right side is a person style painting, but essentially all Indian paintings. That's right. Yeah, they're all essentially, yes, all, well. Well, workshop painting maybe. Yeah, the, the, the answer is yes, they're Indian style, but you can't find Indian paintings like this before this. Mm. So this kind of style that we think becomes what we call company style paintings, this seems to be the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I, we all have the, the idea of uh, Indian paintings, like the Mughal paintings. But these, the Mughal paintings, the Mughal school, and the Mughal court paintings, come immediately after these ones. Mm -hmm. So th this is why they are a little bit sui generis, these paintings. So but mistakenly, no Indians by an Indian, so it has, in fact, if, if, if we know the, what we call Islamic paintings, mm. so that they have an enormous influence. The miniature paintings, paintings on books, this is quintessentially uh, Islamic genre or Islamic mm. way of paintings. And almost the, 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 the square, the, the lines, it has a strong influence of the Islamic painting mm. uh, uh, that comes from the Middle East and from Persia of this early stage. But then immediately after, in the 1550s, it starts another style, glorious style, that is uh, an old painting all around, and with goals, and, and more somehow exquisite, that this is the Mugo. Uh, but this is immediately before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. thank you. Someone else in the back? Here we go. Uh, is there any explanation why in the pictures uh, both the people and the horses are totally uh, disproportional? I mean, you see the, 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 uh, the head and the torso and the horse, they just, any, any reason why the total lack of proportionality? Well, I, I, look, I think, I, the first question is, does it matter? I mean, I, you could say that's a very sort of Western artistic idea that these things have to be done that way. But I think, I think to be fair, um, I think this painter is kind of, he's, 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 he has his talents, but he's not, he's, yeah, he's not, he's not um, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, so uh, I think that when we were looking at these, one of the things that struck us is they're very much like cartoons. They have a feeling of cartoons about them. And if you think of them as cartoons, you know, the idea of sort of that kind of naturalistic accuracy is just not that important. So I think it's probably a combination of paint, people didn't paint like that then. I mean, they did in European Renaissance painting, but in general, that was not an important consideration. And secondly, you know, this was a, he, to call him an artist maybe may be pushing the point a bit hard. He was a craftsman. Exactly. He was a craftsman, not an artist. And so what he was setting out to do was to create an illustration of something that probably the boss said he wanted illustrated. And if the boss was more interested in the shape of the Chris than the size of the hands or something, then that was probably what he did. I mean, that's my guess. Yeah, the people were a bit big, but they're pretty small horses. <laughs> yes. uh, I have two questions. Uh, first one is: uh, we, we've 
we see quite a lot of uh, flowers in the bottom part yeah. of these paintings. Do they carry any special meaning or cultural uh, connotations? Uh, because they yeah. appear quite a, quite a number of times. Uh, the second yeah. question let me ask, is... Let me do the first one first. Okay. I'll forget the first one. That you uh, the answer is that uh, I think that some of the vegetation along the bottom is probably just vegetation. You're just filling in. You've got to do something. Uh, but, you, but you notice that very often the woman is holding something. She's holding a flower. She's holding something else. And we read all the scholarship on this, and people were claiming that this had meaning. Uh, and I guess it probably does, but to be honest with you, I don't think we were convinced by, you know, that someone was holding a red flower, someone else holding another flower. And, and I just wasn't convinced by the explanation. So it probably does have meaning, but... Yeah. Well, it, it's true, in, in Europe at the time, there is also a convention in Cortius painting like for the betrothal, so for the marriage, so this that a woman is is, is, is having a flower, and it happens just as the very, it, it is also why couples, so why to explain the wall that fascinated all these Portuguese men feel attached and feel integrated and feel loved, and maybe it's like a testimony of somehow oh. the attachment of love to it. But they are couples, and the central picture is a wedding. So I think these gestures and also they look to each other like very friendly, very, but at the same time, so there are uh, conventions in Europe, so the first travel uh, books, they depict the, the same. And then later in Manila, there is the Boxer Coder, Codex, that now is in Indiana University, used to belong to the British historian C.R. Boxer that was living in Hong Kong, actually. Uh, he was professor of Portuguese in King's College, London. Could He's this be a special... Couples, couples, no relation, no relation with that. No, right? yes, your question. Could this be a special species of flower in India, the purple color, in the bottom part of the paintings? They always appear in purple color. Okay, the, the short answer is anything's possible. Um, when when Juan and I started to look at the Codex, because we were, it was part of a project with the Italian Cultural Institute, because the Codex is in Rome, uh, and there was some interest to see if maybe it could be brought out here to, to Asia to look at. Um, and so we said, well, people don't know about it very well, so why don't Juan and I at least try to document it and do a small book? And at first we thought it was a whole bunch of pretty pictures. And we started to look at it and said, you know, it's, it's something we're missing here. And we started to, and we read the scholarship, and the scholarship wasn't explaining very much. They basically said, yeah, it's a bunch of pretty pictures. Um, and there was a little bit, maybe this is meaning or not. The sorts of, and then we started to find the relationship with the Western art, the relationship with the, with the uh, Indian art that came before. We started to begin to pick out that there was maybe a story in here. Uh, and at that point, we said, okay, that's about as much as we can do given what we know and the resources we have. So the point is that I think we've proved that there's much more to the codex than just pretty pictures. Uh, but I'm sure there's much more to it than we found. And the sorts of things that you're talking about, I'm sure, are part of it. But we frankly don't know enough. That's very specialized symbol symbology kinds of things, and not things that we know. So one of the hopes is that other people will pick this up and start filling in the blank. What was your second question? Uh, in the early part of the PowerPoint, yeah. you saw us the pic a picture of the church, right. some sort of medieval style. Right. Was this a replica from a Portuguese church built in India, or no, locally adapted to the local climate? The, it looks quite different it's from the Western architecture we used to see. It looks like a castle. It looks like, like a castle, like a fortress, like a tower. So, uh, well, how they build, uh, this, particularly at the very first, early stage, so maybe it's not a complete translation of uh, what there was in Portugal. Uh, immediately after, yes, there are, you can see that there are almost replicas of the, the churches in Portugal. 
there are fantastic books about uh, uh, colonial uh, Portuguese architecture in India, and most of those churches uh, still stand. They are uh, impressive testimonies of, of Western art in Asia, in including, for example, the facade, retablo facade, or retablo facade. So there was a question here. Yes, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, because you said um, uh, the colonization of Goa is very much related to the spreading of Catholicism uh, with Francis Xavier, but it seems that a lot of paint, the, the paintings, only one painting is shown with um, a Catholic nuance, or, or you say it's a baptism or whatever, the two, uh, the two Catholics there. So the Codex is not... Uh, anything to do with the spread of Catholicism, and I thought it's kept in Roman, why is that? Well, uh, I think, thank you very much for your question. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, uh, it is true, it has nothing to do uh, with the church, nothing to do with the doctrines of the church. So it's completely, uh, the inspiration is completely different. So this is why it's somehow a local vision. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is fantastic also for this reason, this absence of somehow elements of the church. So this is somehow a story told from the point of view of an Indian, although the patron is a Portuguese. There is also another point in uh, somehow uh, in, the, in the presence of Portuguese in Asia. And there is a little bit difference with the Spanish. Uh, you can read, uh, so I recommend uh, again to read any book by C.R. Boxer, Charles Ralph Boxer. He was in the military in Hong Kong. He was, during the Second World War, a prisoner of war by the Japanese. And he was a great scholar. And he wrote very, very well. As I said, he was later professor of Portuguese in his college, London. So he also explained that the, the Portuguese, at the beginning, at least they didn't have this apostolic seal uh, as, as the Spanish. So the Spanish, the priests, the clerics, uh, were on, on the front front. For, uh, so, so they were in, in the front line of the, uh, so they, they, they spearheading the colonization, so to speak, that we don't pronounce this word. Never use it, and although it has a Latin origin, but not in the sense that colonialism is. There. Therefore, there were also not many clerics at the beginning. That is also explained sometimes why the text, why not so much is written or what it has been written, has not been published. Even in the case of China, there was only one booklet published by a, a priest by. Uh, in, in Coimbra, but it, it was a booklet. It was the Spanish that finally translate everything of, written by the Portuguese. And they acknowledge that they come from Portuguese sources. Uh, and so this is one of the most remarkable, so your question here is one of the most defining remarkable questions here. I think, you know, you have to ask, so why, why did somebody make this bunch of watercolors in the first place? It seems to be the sort of thing that he would have at home, you know, and people would come around for drinks or something, and they'd take it out and they'd look at the pictures, and uh, and uh, you know, and the people who who would come around, they'd been to many of these places, and they would say, "Yes, I've been here, and this is where I've been." So there were like discussion pieces that people would have. Uh, the guy, this guy would have in his house as something to show his friends and other people. Um, they probably weren't interested in talking about religion. Right? <laughs> That's not what you, you get. So the painter and the patron are not Catholics, basically. Well, the, the, the patron almost certainly was, because he was, he, was, he was Portuguese. I would think it's very unlikely that the painter's Christian. And, he, you know, his, and the reason I say that is because um, his, 
his, there's very little Christian iconography in there. It's only really in one place in the picture of the St. Thomas Christians where he has a picture of the crucifix with the INRI on top. And it just looks like he copied it from someone. Someone said, this is what it is he copied. So he doesn't seem to have any real control from, his, from inside himself of any kind of Christian iconography. In fact, his control of even Western things doesn't seem very strong. Uh, you know, there's 76 watercolors. Portuguese appear in four or five of them. And if you look carefully at the Portuguese, the things he gets right are the clothes and the swords. And the rest of it's kind of not really very right. So I, I think, yes, he seems pretty Indian. Thank you. You assume that he's only one painter. Yes. To justify the, all, of all the seventy-six, and yes. and he would do, and he would not be traveling, or 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 was he in the different places, or he was doing it by the description that he was given of the places. Okay, it depends who you ask. All right. Uh, the, um, we, we think there's only one painter. We had a long discussion about this. We've been through it. The paintings are very similar. Uh, and you can make some guesses about the order in which he did them. Uh, and you can see him getting better. Uh, in some of the paintings that look to be earlier ones, the people all have got two left hands or two <laughs> left feet. I mean, but the Indian paintings are the same. I mean, they didn't care feet. So you have Indian dancing girls with two left feet or two right feet. And somewhere around the last sort of 20 of them, he worked out that people got two different feet. And, and you can see the change in the painting. So not only do we think it's one painter, we, we feel we can see him learning as he goes along. Um, originally, people thought that he was traveling around, but there's no reason to think so. And there are reasons to think he wasn't. And the, the reason to think he wasn't is that, as I say, there are mistakes in the paintings. Like, the Africans are all dressed in Indian saris, and, the peop and not everybody in, in, the, in, the, in East Asia is dressed in a sari, but it's kind of like there are things that he knew that the, okay, the reports are all coming back from men, right? So the men come back and they describe the swords and the men's dresses, and they weren't paying attention to the women at all. And so the women were, in most cases, probably blank spots. And so he did the best he could, right? He said, OK, I put a sari on. So this, is, so this is why we think he probably didn't travel around very much. He was probably local. And, and, as they, and if you look at the case of the Chinese painting, this was clearly done from the description. Like, French shoes with the square toes. And they got French shoes with square toes. And no one had ever seen Chinese shoes. They hadn't seen so, so, and there are other cases like that. So we think that they were taken, some people had seen things, they're pretty accurate, other times they hadn't, and they were kind of making it up. So this is, this is our guess. Did you speak contemporary on El Greco and fire and some other things too? A bit earlier than El Greco. El Greco. So 40 years, that's, not, well, that's not. over 500 years, that's yeah. not too bad. Yeah, no, he's a bit earlier than that. So he's, yeah. he'd be more, what, Raphael in that period, I guess, or something like that. Late Leonardo, late, late Leonardo, late Leonardo um, the, If you're looking for sort of parallels, as I say, the parallels seem to be some of these German woodcuts. Uh, not Albrecht Durer, but that kind of. He came after that, but kind of there, and these guys called Hans Bergen, <coughs> and some of the guys that were doing woodcuts for the first printed books. Because you can see some of that leaking back into what he does. So it looks like he must have seen some of these books. So that's kind of the period. But it's really hard to match up because they were complete, artistically, they were like completely separate places. I had a question just about the perspective here. So uh, is your thought that this, this that this final codex that's been produced, these 76 paintings, are a retrospective on this patron's life. So this, this patron is 
dictating their thoughts or their recollections to the artist and the artist is then putting those down on in their art? Or is this something where maybe this patron has, has hired this artist numerous times to draw things that they're experiencing, go out, come back, almost like maybe a modern day social, or a, an ancient social media, a historic thing? Or is this an end of life thing where this patron's looking back on all these experiences? Okay, complete speculation, absolute guess. I, I think the kind of, there were, there were painters hanging outside the doors of the church offering painter, paintings to things, and either this guy said, would you like something other than the saints, and, or uh, someone asked him. And again, you can kind of put the paintings in order, and there's some earlier ones. The earlier ones, I think, are the scenes, because these are all taking place around the hall. This is the washerwomen and the people getting the water and the farmers and the cattle herders. And you got a feeling that he was kind of doing these, you know, guys said, paint me something, and he did paint me something he knew. Uh, and then the, the ones of the couples seem to be later for the most part. So that seems to have been a project, that the patron said, would you do this for me? I want this. They're stylistically quite similar. Uh, and certainly by the end, they're like five or six or seven that are almost like cartoons. He just copied one and changed the clothes of it. So that seems to have been a project. Um, with regard to the ones about the patron himself, it is tempting to see these as a story. That is, the one when he's in behind the grandee, you know, if he was doing this at the end of his life, let's presume he probably died not long after this was completed. In fact, there's some reasons to think it's not quite finished. He died, it probably ended up at the uh, at the Collegio de Sao Paulo coming through the church somehow there. Um, and so it may have been going on when he died. And you know that would mean then that the painting of him in the entourage would have been relatively early in the Portuguese period, you know, more like the 1510, 1520, he came over early. And so if he'd been 25 or 30 when he came over in 1510, by 1540 when we think the thing was completed, he would have been about that age, right? Uh, and probably the marriage would then have been sometime after that. It looks a bit more mature. So we'd like to think that this is a bit of a retrospective. Um, there certainly, we have some guesses who he might be. We kind of went through the list of all of these guys and said it might be him, it might be him, they went to this place. But no Portuguese person had visited all those places, as far as we know. So it couldn't have been, it couldn't have been a record of his travels, I don't think, because it doesn't seem we couldn't identify someone that had been absolutely everywhere. So it would look like he's gathering information from a variety of places. That's, that's our best guess. But yeah, we think he's a real guy. And I think someone's going to find out who he was. There's enough data in, there's enough information in the codex, in these pictures. And there, these guys wrote all kinds of letters, which are sitting in archives that no one's read them all. You know, they're read by economic historians who look for the price of cattle and the price of but no one's looking for, by the way, I had a painting made there. That's not what people are looking for. So I suspect that somewhere in the archive is the name of this guy. I think we're done. We're out of time. If there are no more questions from the floor, this is the end of the seminar. May I now... <laughs>